Cool. So uh, I'm going to be here to give the welcome address for this 10th anniversary edition of Scala Days, and I'm going to talk mostly about a tour of Scala 3. But before I do that, I also want to show some of the photos of uh, Scala 3. So it was in a much smaller building. This building doesn't exist yet. Uh, 155 people, it was packed with that. Uh, actually, it was really dangerous because here you see me very close to actually the border of this podium. And in fact, probably a second later or so, I fell off, I fell off it between this thing and, and the screen uh, and then resurfaced. So here I already looked and it, it looks solid. So I, I hope it won't happen. Uh, we were all uh, quite a lot younger then, uh, you can see. And you can already see some of the germs of the software that we uh, that you is sort of our daily life now. So here, I think that was probably the first presentation of Akka, Jonas and Victor. Uh, here we have Mark Hara, no doubt thinking about uh, all the grandiose designs of SPT that he had in mind. Here we have Miles. Uh, Miles was not yet working on Shapeless, and I will uh, keep silence on what he what he did then. <laughs> There were some curious parallels between then and now. So in 2010, what was new for the old timers in Scala? What can you remember? What was, what was the hot new thing in 2010? Well, it was actually collections. Uh, Scala 2.8 came out at that conference. And the big new thing was essentially a complete collections framework, which had functional and uh, mutable collections in the same framework. Before we had sort of odds and ends, some specific collections, but not nothing completely generalized. And today, well, today we released yesterday 2.13. And what's the highlight of 2.13? Even better collections. So... This might give the impression that collections have been a t constant topic, but actually, no, uh, that was the first redesign since 2010. And I can attest that it's 100% can build from free. So Scala 2.13 uh, came out yesterday. The big thing was new collections, uh, even better than before, I think. Nicer, uh, cleaner, no, the signatures uh, don't need can build from. And there will be the talk about that by Stefan Zeiger, on Wednesday, uh, 1745. Another thing that got updated was the futures implementation, and there will be a talk by that as well, by Victor Klang on Wednesday, 1430. Uh, 213 was meant to be mostly a, a release, uh, a library release, where we update the libraries, but actually they managed to sneak in quite a few language changes, uh, including literal types. Uh, you're going to see some of them on my slides later. Partial unification, the famous SI2712 is now on by default. Uh, by name implicits, macro annotations, and many, many polishing in details. Overall, uh, we merged over 1,500 pull requests from 162 contributors. And a huge thank you at everyone who... <laughs> thank you everyone who was involved in that and made it happen. There's another curious parallel between now and then. In uh, 2010, when we came out with, uh, with Scala 2.8, uh, people criticized it and said, well, it really should have been Scala 3, because there were some breaking uh, changes in the language. Uh, for instance, the way we resolved uh, package scopes uh, changed, so that was technically a breaking language change, so we should have bumped the major version. We didn't at the time, because we had announced Scala 2.8 already a year ahead, and this was a late change, so we didn't really want to change the brand, the, the brand of the language. Everybody was talking about 2.8. So now, nine years later, we are almost ready. So Scala 3.0 has almost arrived, uh, finally. Uh, and in, in the 10th year's anniversary, it will be really, really close. So that's the big news. Uh, you could say, well, uh, over, over 10 years, the cycle closes itself. At the time, it was something that should have been 3.0, and now we present something that will be 3.0. So the roadmap that we're looking uh, ahead until we uh, finish 3.0 is uh, we have, we're currently here, June 2019. All features have been fleshed out with implementations in the current Dotty release. That we have essentially a rolling release train. Right now we are at uh, 0.16. Uh, 
We plan to go into feature freeze uh, later this year in fall. Uh, the reason why we're not yet in feature freeze is that uh, we want to really play with it ourselves uh, before we uh, freeze it and uh, say it won't change anymore. And from basically today on, our internal setup is such that we will not build with uh, Scala 2 anymore. So that means finally uh, we have a bootstrap that will only bootstrap from ourselves, and we won't even run Scala 2 in the tests. And that means we can finally refactor the compiler and the library and the other code bases to use Scala 3 exclusively. And that means we, get, we actually get to try out all the nice features that we have uh, dreamt of and designed and implemented in our code base. And before we have done that, we don't really want to freeze it and ship something that we might regret later on. So it will take a little bit longer. Uh, until fall this year, and then we will be in actual feature freeze, and that will coincide with the release of Scala 3 Milestone 1. Uh, then we want to give us ourselves a year about to talk to uh, get the stabilization right, essentially pass all the tests, uh, flush out any remaining bugs that we see. Uh, we uh, the whole thing is uh, standardized in the Scala improvement process pro uh, that uh, we have to complete. So the SIP committee did essentially an initial sweep over uh, all the features in there and uh, approved most of them, some of them uh, on probation, uh, essentially uh, waiting for further, uh, uh, for further confirmation in actual use. But we have to go through all the proposals bit by bit, come up with a spec, uh, vote on it, and uh, that way make it part of the language. We need, uh, have to migrate the open source ecosystem. Uh, there's already some, some uh, uh, very encouraging starts. Some of the packages have already started to have versions for Dotty. We need to flesh out the tests, uh, the community build, and we have to work on compatibility and migration tools. So that all together should take about a year, we think. So that means we're looking at a Scala 3.0 final uh, in, at, towards the, the end fall 2020, I would say. In parallel to that, uh, there's ongoing development in the Scala 2 branch, so but at about this time, we also hope to have a 2.14, uh, which, uh, whose purpose will be essentially to ease the migration to this new language, Scala 3. So, what's in it? Uh, so, what's in it for you, for the developers, uh, what's in the language? It's actually a rather big, big envelope. It's stuffed full with features. So uh, to structure it a little bit, I thought I'd do a best of tour. So I want to essentially do a best of Scala 3, uh, asking what, are, what, in my opinion, are the nicest features of uh, Scala 3, the nicest new features. And there, of course, it depends who you are. Uh, a beginner might appreciate something which uh, an expert find, might find boring, and an expert might be uh, might be blown away by a thing which is completely incomprehensible to a beginner. So I have graded it to say one uh, uh, feature for beginners, one for everyday coding, one for experts. So I'll give you for my personal ranking of the top three in each category. And I also did a Twitter survey uh, last weekend uh, where I've, uh, Overall, I think uh, I got 1,500 or more responses, so I respond on that, what the public thought. So, nicest features for beginners. Actually, at, at that level, most of the language stays the same, so there's not that much, but there are nevertheless a few improvements worth mentioning. So, number three, in my opinion, is that we are going to drop new. So, here you have a class, String Builder, uh, just a boring class. It's not a case class or anything. And in the future, you'll be able to write just String Builder ABC or String Builder Open Parents, Close Parents. And that's the same as if you had written the thing with new. So you still have new around. The main reason is that it's, you needed to disambiguate uh, notably if you, what you write is the apply method. Let's say you, have, uh, you want to do some checking, additional checking or hash consing or whatever. In the apply method of your string builder class, then if you just call string builder without any arguments, then you risk calling yourself, which of course wouldn't do. That wouldn't give you a string builder. So there you have sort of the new as a fallback to say we can still use this to create one. But we anticipate that generally new will be gone uh, because it's just nicer to, to not do it and it doesn't add anything in the future. 
Okay. Uh, the uh, one advantage of that, is, of course, is that you don't need to define a case class anymore just to get nice uh, constructor calls. And there were quite a few people who did that. What's number two? So for me, number two is uh, top-level definitions. Top-level definitions is essentially dropping a restriction. Uh, previously, uh, your top-level definitions had to be objects or classes, and now they can be anything. So you can inside a package, or you can also leave out the package and not do anything. Uh, you can have type definitions, val definitions, uh, method definitions, uh, all of these things. So that means that package objects are no longer needed, and they will be phased out. Uh, deprecated in, in future versions and afterwards finally phased out. That was number two. So what's number one? Well, clearly for me number one is enums. Enums is just such a nice and simple way to define a new type uh, with a finite number of values or constructors. So enum color, case red, green, blue, finish. That's all you need. And uh, right now, in, in, in Scala, it's, it wasn't actually that simple to set up something like that. There were uh, uh, libraries. There was an enumeration type in the standard library that worked sort of. Uh, there was a, a package called enumeratum that also worked sort of. But it's just much, much more straightforward to have this in the language. Furthermore, what you have is not just the, the, the simple thing, so that was the simplest example, but you can actually add everything to it that a Java enum would do. Uh, so you could, can have enums that have uh, parameters, like this one here. You can have cases that pass parameters, so here the planets give you the mass and the radius. You can have uh, fields, you can have methods in these enums. And in fact, you can be fully Java compatible, so that's done here by just extending Java lang enum, so that that's essentially a sign to the compiler that the uh, compiler should generate code so that this enum is, uh, a, for Java, a, a, a honest enum that it can, you, can be used like any other enums. Okay, so this is, again, cool. Uh, now we have parity with Java, but we can actually go way further. Enums can not only have value parameters, they also can have type parameters, like this. So you can have an enum option with a covariant type parameter t, and then two cases, sum and none. So that, of course, gives you what people call an algebraic data type, or ADT. Uh, Scala so far was lacking a simple way to write an algebraic data type. What you had to do is essentially what the compiler would translate this to. So the compiler will take this ADT that you've seen here and translate it into essentially this. And so far, if you wanted something like that, you would have written essentially the same thing. So a sealed abstract class or a sealed trait option with a case class as one case, and here it's a val, but otherwise you could also use a case ob object as the other case. Um, and that, of course, is completely workable, uh, but it's kind of tedious. Um, when Scala started, the main, uh, or one of the main motivations was to avoid pointless boilerplate. So that's why case classes were invented and a lot of other innovations that just made um, uh, code more pleasant to write and more compact than Java code, the standard at the time. And uh, it, one has to recognize that during all these years, the software world has shifted also a little bit, and it's now much more functional than before. So an algebraic data type would have been something very foreign at the time, 2003, 2004, when Scala came out, but now it's pretty, pretty common, and people write them and write more and more of them, because also with essentially more static typing, you, have, you want to write more and more types, uh, more and more class hierarchy, uh, case hierarchies, and ADTs are just a lovely, simple way to do that. So in the spirit of reducing boilerplate, it, seemed, it, it, it was uh, about time uh, to have something that uh, makes this case simple and straightforward to express. But that's, that's not even the end of it. We can do more. So we can also do GADTs. GADTs are generalized algebraic data types. And they're different from normal AD ADTs in that the cases can inherit the base class at different types. So here you would have an enum tree of t, 
and three cases, true, false, and is zero, that extended at type Boolean, and two more cases that extended at type int, and a final case if that takes uh, a tree of Booleans and two tree of t, t arbitrary, and that just extends a tree at the type where the then part and the else part extended. So this sort of thing is actually relatively advanced, not that many languages have it. And I believe there's not a single, at least not a single widespread language out there that has enums, ADTs, and GADTs all in the same language feature. I think Haskell has, of course, GADTs, but a GADT is written completely differently from an ADT. It's a different construct. Whereas here, it's a natural progression. Okay, so that was my personal favorites. Uh, what about the public? So the public actually agrees by and large, so public liked enum best uh, by a large margin. Uh, uh, drop new was second, and top-level definitions were third. So why enums? Why do we all agree on enums? Well, there are lots of use cases, and they're becoming more common. It avoids boring, repetitive boilerplate, and it can grow from very, very simple color, red, green, blue, to actually very, very powerful, full-blown AG ADTs that uh, can, can extend the base types at different types. And if you take it that far, then of course you would say, well, that's way beyond a feature for beginners. So it's a feature so that essentially takes a beginner until the beginner is no longer a beginner, but uh, experienced or even an expert. So enums are a feature not just for beginners, but definitely also for everyday coding. But now I've already used my number one, so I'll have other features, find, to, uh, find other features for everyday coding. There are actually lots and lots of candidates for this level, and it's hard to even come up with a short list, so even that was uh, somewhat arbitrary. But I'm, I try nevertheless to say, well, what are, what are the three top innovations there? Uh, for me, number three is union types. Uh, so here you have an example of a union type. Uh, so first you have two case classes, username and password, here and here. And then you have a help function that essentially can get some identification, which is either a username or a password. And essentially, depending on what it is, uh, you uh, look up the name or you look up uh, the password. And uh, so this gives you essentially an ad hoc combination of two types, username and password, didn't have a common superclass, they weren't designed that way, but it doesn't matter, you can just write the union type, username or password right here. Where do we have it? Here. So that's the vertical bar right here. So it gives you a very flexible way to model types because subsetting, so having fewer choices, is subtyping. Uh, and that means you can always essentially go from one to the other very flexibly. The current alternative is, uh, so in a sense, uh, heavier and bulkier. That's the, the alternative would be to use an either. So you could, of course, write either username and password, but then you would have to inject with left and right, and you would have to extract. And it's, in a sense, here not necessary because you don't need a left and or right as an injection or extraction because the class the classes are perfectly good to distinguish between the two you can in since it's object oriented they're just normal classes you can ask is it a username or is it a password of course there are some situations where you need an either be it because you, you need it in a generic setting, or maybe sometimes you actually have the same type on the left and on the right, and then, of course, you need an additional tag. A union type wouldn't work. But in 99% of the situations, I, I imagine a union type would fit the bill quite well. And I should say there's no boxing overhead like with either. Essentially, the username or password, the representation is literally what the underlying representation is. So you don't need another object that essentially represents the alternative between one or the other. Another nice uh, uh, aspect of union types is that they work with singleton types. So you can now define a command. We say the command is either the string click, that is an example of a literal type that uh, I've shown you in 2.13. So a literal type, we can just use literals like that and say, well, that's, that's, it's the type that just consists of the single string click. And uh, here, to continue the example, the command would be click or drag or key pressed. And then you could have an event handler that takes a command, so we know it's one of these three, and just has essentially a pattern match on those three things, and we know that pattern match is exhaustive. 
So this is nice. If the handle event had taken a more general type like string, you couldn't verify that the pattern match was actually exhaustive. Somebody could come up with a different name or mis mistype a string, and the result would be a runtime failure. Whereas here, everything is kept safely. So that was number three for me. So what's better than union types? Well, for me, it, it's, it's a tough, it's a very close race, but for me, I would put at number two, extension methods. So extension methods are a very neat way to uh, just define methods uh, that can then be used in fix uh, without any big uh, boilerplate or contortions. So you say, hey, uh, I mean, this method actually exists uh, and it's uh, implemented with an implicit class, which are replaced by this feature. But if I wanted to uh, redefine it myself, so I want to have a, th a thing which says, well, take a string and uh, concatenate the string with itself the number of times that I give you. So I star operator for strings. So the most obvious way to write it would be to say, well, I want to define a, a star, but it should come after a string. So I put an argument to the left, and the right argument is an int. So that's the number of times I want that string to repeat. And it gives me back a string. And here's the implementation. If x is less than or equal to 0, then it's the empty string. Otherwise, it's s times x minus 1 plus plus s. So I can use this star immediately as an infix operator here and here. Oops, that I jumped ahead and gave it away. Um, so uh, that makes it a lot easier to add methods to, to, to existing classes. And for that reason, it's for me number two. Uh, the other nice thing about extension methods is it, that it plays really well with the number one feature in my list. And the number one feature in my list is delegates. So delegates are a new way to think about implicits. Implicits, of course, are everywhere in Scala. 95 point something uh, uh, percent of all projects use some form of implicits, according to a survey. So they are sort of the bedrock of, uh, of uh, programming in Scala. Nevertheless, implicits have a lot of challenges. People get confused. People uh, do it the wrong way. People curse uh, that if they have to use other people's systems where implicits were set up wrongly. So uh, we thought that it, there should be a concerted effort to get out the good parts of implicits and remove the, the uh, traps and the pitfalls as much as possible. And part of the answer for that, not all of it, but part of the answer for that is syntax. So the new way to define an implicit is here called a delegate. So what you have here is a standard setup of implicits. You have a trait ORT. It has an extension method compare to with two things. It has another extension method less than that uses compare to like this one. So that's my trait ORT. And now I want to essentially have various implementations of this trait. And I, here I just show you a, a single one that integers are ordered. So I have this, and I, here's what I write. I write delegate int ORT for ORT of int. And then I give you the implementation of the compare to method. The implementation of the less than method, of course, is then inherited uh, as usual. And uh, the last bit of the slide is I have a maximum method that says, well, I want to get a list of t's of arbitrary element type t, but there must be an order of t. Uh, so the uh, order of t must be implemented. So for instance, list of int would qualify because here I have an int ord, and here's the implementation of maximum. So it's a it's the usual reduce operator that uses the less than operator that it gets from the ord instance. If you want to do the same thing with current implicits, I challenge you, I don't think you will fit this on one slide. It's possible, uh, but it's really hard, in particular with uh, infix operators, because you will have, need one implicit to essentially set, the, set up the basic type classes and then another to pull in the, uh, the um, uh, infix operators as, uh, as uh, decorators and things like that. So this is a, a, a much simpler way to talk about these things. And it actually turns out it works really well with type classes. 
So here you see another example, a typical type class thing where we have semi-groups, that's a trait with a combined method. We have monoids, uh, which uh, add a unit method. So again, this is an extension method, this is a normal method. And now we have a delegate for monoid of string. So uh, the delegate can actually be anonymous. Uh, I can leave out the name. And it gives you implementations of both uh, the extension method here that's the combined method, and the unit method over there. And um, then I can define a, a sum method that takes an arbitrary type that must have monoid as a context bound. So that's an, just, as usual, uh, another way to say that there must be a monoid of T, uh, a delegate of type monoid of T, and it takes a list of Ts, and it gives you back a T, and it uses a fold left, where it starts with the monoid of t dot unit. So the is basically the uh, same thing as implicitly, but slightly better. It has a, has a, gives you a more precise type. Uh, so you say the monoid of t dot unit. So that gives you the unit thing. And then you call the combined function. So the reason why this works is actually, I mean, here it all looks completely natural and simple. But the reason why this works is, is actually uh, uh, quite subtle. So the reason why this works is that uh, the fact that I can use an extension method hangs together with the fact that I have a monoid instance in scope. So there's a rule for extension methods that say you, uh, if, if they are uh, defined in something for which you have a delegate instance in scope, then you can apply it. Not You don't need to just import it or bring it into scope otherwise. So that's essentially a very well uh, thought out combination of extension methods and these delegates. Uh, another uh, nice aspect of delegates is that they tame implicit conversions. So here you have an implicit conversion. If you read an implicit tutorial for Scala, then often it will start off with something like that, into string or something like that. Uh, so you have, you just write implicit and then a def and a string, and it gives you here a token, and that's a keyword of string, whatever. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Nothing really. This is a perfectly good, good, good method, uh, but well, it's too easy, actually, because uh, we have learned all that writing a lot of these conversions is probably a recipe for disaster because they tend to interact very badly one with each other and they just add too much implicitness. So it's too easy to write compared to how dangerous it is. Implicit as a modifier will go away and with it this kind of conversion. So in the future these things will be first deprecated and then phased out. So if these things are no longer, no longer available, what do you do then to write a conversion? Well, A, the answer is probably think hard whether you really need one, because like I said, implicit conversions in 95% of the cases in my experience are really the wrong solutions. But if after this deliberation you decide that, yes, I do need an implicit conversion, then you can define it as a delegate. So again, the idea is that now the only way to express implicit conversions is as a delegate for a standard class called Scala.conversion. Uh, so here you have a co conversion of string to token, and you ca can define a delegate for it, which means that if uh, implicit search tries to find a term uh, of this type, conversion string to token, then the delegate would essentially qualify and would be chosen. And the delegate would then have an apply method, because conversions are essentially functions, uh, and that essentially does what you need to do. What you can also do is you can make it a little bit uh, shorter. You can use an alias delegate. You can say here delegate for conversion string token equals new keyword underscore. So that would also work. That would give you the same thing uh, using SAM types as a mechanism. Okay, so that was the, uh, the, my personal uh, ranking, delegates, extension methods, union types. Let's see what the public said. So... Public actually picked union types first, so it was uh, the, the, my ranking was reversed. Extension methods second, and revised implicits. That's uh, what I called them in the in the in the uh, on the poll uh, third. So why do I believe that delegates are uh, nevertheless number one in this list? Well, like I said, implicits are Scala's most 
distinguished feature, but they are also the most controversial feature, really. And delegates give you a much simpler and safer alternative. The main difference, if you think about delegates or the traditional implicits, is that delegates emphasize intent over mechanism. With the current implicit, you said, well, you can slap it on everything, on a, on a val, on a var, no, not on a var, on a val, on a def, on an object, on a class, and it sort of subtly changes the meaning of things uh, in ways which are quite logical. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not uh, mystical. The specification is quite uh, precise about it, but it was sort of a mechanistic, mechanistic thing that people had to say, well, I want to construct now this thing, and here's how I do it. It wasn't so much that they expressed the intent to say, well, I have a type class and I want to have an instance or delegate for this type class at this type. You could achieve that, but there were many, many steps sometimes to get there, to arrive there, and having many steps to arrive there also means having many steps to get it wrong. So that, that's essentially now gone. Uh, then they therefore make the idea of term inference much more accessible. Instead of saying, basically, you have five different meanings of the word implicit, there's a single one for delegate. So we only have to teach a single thing. And finally, they discourage abuses. I've already shown you that essentially the easy way to write implicit conversions is gone. They will also tighten the belt for imports, which is sort of the other big problematic feature with implicits, where you say, I don't know where my implicits are coming from. So delegates have an answer for that as well. So there are actually many improvements, it's not just syntax, over the current implicits, uh, which I can't really go into details, including uh, names don't matter. In fact, everything can be anonymous for implicits because you want to essentially trade a term for a type. You never want to know what the term is precisely called. Nesting is significant, uh, which means that you can actually have a simple way to achieve local coherence. Uh, there are no shadowing problems. Uh, we restricted the implicit scope where implicits are searched, which avoids some nasty surprises. There's a more robust prioritization. Uh, there are no accidental conversions that you can get, and we have better error, error messages. The hardest thing for that was really not coming up with a design. The design has been stable for about six months now, but naming them. Uh, what are these things called, these terms that I say, well, the compiler says, I need an implicit of a type, so then it comes up with a term. What do you call the term? Well, you can say implicit instance or implicit object or implicit value, that's what we said, but that's a compound thing. That's not, that's not a simple thing that you say, well, it's this. And uh, we went actually through a long list of names. My original proposal was witness. That got shut down, and then there was evidence and impl and instance and implied and assume and so on. And in the end, we settled on delegate. In the end, I believe it won't matter much. We just need a noun that's easy to remember. We need a noun in, in, because we want to talk about these things as a class, uh, as, a, as, a, as a categorization. Great, so that was the, my number one for the everyday coding. What about experts, advanced features? So since Scala 3 puts metaprogramming on a new basis, there's actually lots of advanced features to choose from, and it's very difficult to pick a winner. So I give you again my, my personal list. And at number three, I would put match types. So here's what you can do with match types. Uh, I've simplified things a little bit. So let's say we have a tuple uh, enum with two cases, empty and pair. So uh, a pair tuple or an empty tuple. Uh, now, wouldn't it be nice if we could write a concat function that concatenates arbitrary tuples? Uh, before we write such a concat function, we have to say, well, what, should, what would the type of that concat function be? Of course, it could return tuple, but that wouldn't be very specific. What you really would want to is that if, let's say, if I have a pair of int and string and I want to concatenate that with a pair of boolean and float, then I would get int string boolean float, a four tuple. So I want to compute types uh, at compile time. Uh, by the compiler. So here's how I would do this now with using match types. So I can actually define a type concat that takes essentially two subtypes of tuples, so that would be my pair types or whatever, and then it, I can have a match in the type which says, well, if 
the first of this type is uh, the empty tuple, then the result of concatenation is the second, uh, second uh, uh, parameter. And if it's a pair with an element type uh, x and the second element type xs, then uh, the result is again a pair uh, with the first element type here and a concatenation of the rest xs and ys as a second element. So this is just like computing with functions, like, like you would probably write the concat function, but on types. So the whole thing works on types. Um, it's, uh, you could say, well, that in principle, that's not new. We know how to do that. It's called age lists, right? So in current Scala, this is age lists. So what's the difference between this and age list? Well, in age list, age lists are a way to define implicits. So you can essentially, uh, you can never talk about a type being the concatenation of two other types. What you can say is it's a type variable result and there's an age list implicit that takes essentially two, the two input types and the result type and puts them in relation to each other. So it's like the difference between logic programming, which is what age lists is really. You only have clauses that put things in relation and functional programming, what this is. So because you have, you have a function that defines the result directly. And the, the effect can be quite, quite profound, uh, which we will see when we apply match types in the other things on my, rank, on, on my ranking. So what's number two? So for me, number two is uh, type class derivation. Uh, so we've seen type classes will be very important. Uh, there's a much nicer syntax for them. Uh, there's one problem, though, with type classes, and that is that while it's very easy for an enum or a class uh, to extend an interface, it's a lot more boilerplate-y and, and, and cumbersome to have it derive a type class, to have it implement a type class. And it doesn't really have to do that way because a lot of these type class implementations, be it for equality or ordering or serialization, they're actually pretty boring. They're very repetitive. They do the same thing over and over again for every case class that you define. So in, uh, in Scala 3, what you can do here is you can define an enum or a class, it doesn't matter, and you can just say it derives equal and ordering and picking. And it can derive any type class, including type classes that you define. So what uh, does this derive to, it derives, uh, uh, expand to? Well, it's actually quite simple. This generates simply three delegates, uh, which all have the form that we say, well, the type T, type parameter T must be recursively have the same uh, type class. And then it's essentially it would give you an instance of the type class equal ordering and pickling. And the right hand side is always a, a method dot derived that must exist in the type class. So dot derived is where you as a library designer come in. That's the function that you have to define to make this all work. So, so far this is essentially just very nice surface syntax for the user of your library so that the user of your library can mix in the type classes without any contortions. So I should say, how you do the, the uh, equal dot derived, there will be a talk uh, about this by Miles Seven, who will, has essentially just finished Shapeless 3 for Scala 3, uh, that will essentially use this mechanism to derive type classes. But I wanted to give you a little glimpse sort of on the, on the, the techniques used for that anyway. So here's sort of a thing or the start of a thing to roll it yourself. Uh, if you use Miles Shapeless, you can essentially condense that a lot and you don't need to write all this. But it's actually uh, quite, just, just to give you a, 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 a sh an, an inkling of what this would look like. So here's the derived method for the EQ uh, class. So it gives you a new instance of the type class. It has to define the equal method, which takes two elements of the type and gives you a Boolean. And what it also gets as a, a given class, a, a parameter, is essentially a mirror. And a mirror is something that essentially represents the type structure of uh, the T here, mirror of T. Uh, 
So what it do would then it would then say, well, what kind of mirror do I have? Is it, is it a sum or is it a product? A sum is uh, essentially an alternative. A product is uh, is a, a case class typically. Uh, and then I, it would essentially do something which is adapted to this kind of mirror. So for the sum of, it would call a method in the mirror which is called ordinal. So that gives you basically the case of the instance that X is. So it would say, well, what's the case number starting from zero of what X is? And then it would say, well, that must be actually be the same as the ordinal of Y, because otherwise they couldn't be equal. And then we have to go into equal cases, which essentially will know, again, statically, what are the element types of this type. Uh, and it would go through that. And if it's a product, it will essentially go to through equal elements, and again, it will know the element types of the product. So then to actually make work, uh, you have to dissect these types, and the way you do that is typically with match types and what you've seen here uh, with inline methods. So this whole essentially construction, which works with uh, match types, inline methods, macros, uh, is essentially the thing that makes it all tick, and Shapeless 3 gives you essentially just a very, very nice cover on top of it. So about the basics, there will be a talk by Nicolas Stucki on Thursday, 11.15. So what's number one? So actually, number one is a suggestion from Miles. Uh, number one, I think a good way to wrap number one up is to say functions everywhere. So what does that mean? Well, in Scala, as you know, we have methods, which are just essentially members of classes and objects, and we have functions, which are objects themselves, and they're two different things. And there's a reason for that, because otherwise, essentially, you'd get, you'd get an infinite recursion. So functions are values, are objects, and methods are members of objects. And so far, uh, me methods were quite a bit more powerful than functions. Methods could be dependent, so the result type could depend on the parameter types. They could be polymorphic, so they could have type parameters. And of course, they could be implicit, they could take implicit parameters. But functions could be none of these things. Why not? Well, because there were no types that could express these things as function types. You got only the normal function type A to B or A and B to C or whatever, and uh, you couldn't express these dependencies, polymorphism or implicit. And now in Scala 3, you can. So here's an example of a dependent function. So here you, you start up, let's say you have a graph and it has two member types, node and edge, and then you want to write a node extractor, which is a function that takes a graph and it gives you as a result a result of a, a value of type g dot node. So uh, the g here refers to the actual parameter. So that we call a dependent method, if it's a method, or here it's a function type, dependent function type. So in Scala 3, uh, you have dependent function types that mirror dependent methods. Uh, about polymorphic methods, uh, let's say you want to give you the type of the identity function in pre-def. I would say, well, it's t to t for any t. And you, I would respond, yes, but what is the type? How do you make that into a type? So now you can. What you need is essentially a function type that says, well, for any type t, gives, it gives me t to t. So you have functions that can have not only values as arguments, but that can have types as arguments. And finally, for implicit, so methods can be implicit and functions can be the same. So here you would have a, a type executable uh, that is a function type that says it goes from execution context to T, but the execution to context is given or implicit, which means that whenever I have a value of that function, as for a given parameter, the argument will be synthesized automatically by the compiler. Cool. So that was the, the, my top three for the experts. What about the public vote? So the public vote actually by a large margin put type class derivation first, uh, but uh, maybe it was because I only had implicit function types. So one third of essentially the functions everywhere mantra. So if you add the other ones, maybe that would have gotten more supports. And match types uh, were uh, tied with implicit function types on second place. 
Okay, so one, I want to conclude with one nice way that, that uh, po points to uh, some of the synergies that these features could have. So here the uh, task is we want to enable that syntax here. So we want to be able to write list of one, two, three, dot sum. Of course, we can do that. And then we want to use ensuring, so that's a post condition, result equals six. Ensuring is a method in pre-def. Uh, who has used ensuring already? Not that many. More of you should. It's a very, very useful method because it essentially lets you program with contracts. Um, the, the problem so far was that ensuring couldn't really talk about the result that uh, uh, the function added without put in making a lambda here. So it had to say uh, basically result arrow result equals x. And that, that was kind of clunky. So it, would, it feels much nicer to just have essentially a name for it to say that the result should be 6. So how can we achieve that by just essentially clever coding? So here's what we would do. Uh, we have to define this object post conditions. Uh, so here's ensuring. It's an infix method. It's, a, it's an extension method as because it's used essentially on arbitrary uh, elements of type T. Uh, it, and it takes a condition. And the condition is one of these uh, implicit function types. So it takes a wrap T. So uh, that basically will in the end be the, your result uh, uh, to Boolean. And what it says, it says is, well, just assert this condition given x. Uh, so the x is essentially the result that would slot into uh, the, the argument of this condition. So we pass the result to the condition, and uh, the condition then will essentially return true or false, and it must return true, or we get an assertion violation. So what then is result, this result that we called? Well, the result is simply a uh, function that takes an implicit parameter r of type wrap of t and gives you back a t. And what is wrap? Well, wrap is essentially a thing that makes the whole thing safe because we, for arbitrary t's we don't want to carry around implicit. So it's a thing where we say, well, that's essentially a, a wrapper for the type t that is only used here in this context. And uh, in fact, this wrapper t, uh, it doesn't do anything, it is equal to t, it's a type alias, but it's an opaque type alias that I know only in this setting. Cool. So now probably your head, or some, some of your heads spin, I uh, can't see very well uh, because of the lighting. So, and you ask yourself, is Scala 3 a new language? This all looks pretty wild and foreign to me. And the answer is yes. Uh, so there are many language changes. There will be feature removals. There are already many feature removals. There will be more in the future. The new constructs improve user experience and onboarding quite dramatically in some cases. And the books of Scala will have to be rewritten. So a, a current book on Scala will feel dated for this new language. But on the other hand, you could also answer no, because it's still Scala. It still looks and feels like Scala all of the core constructs remain in place, and a large and very practical common subset between Scala and Scala, Scala 2 and Scala 3 exists. I know because our compiler code base is written in this subset. Uh, by, by tomorrow, probably, it will diverge because now we don't have to do it anymore. But until now, it was written in the subject. It wasn't it's, uh, in this subset. It wasn't painful at all. Basically, everything you have in Scala 2, you can still use. Another... Uh, a large software package, actually larger, much larger than Scala compiler that compiles in both already is Scala test. So between yes and no, I think the fairest answer is to say it's really a process. Scala 3 keeps most constructs of Scala of 2.13 alongside the new ones. And some constructs like old implicits and so on will be deprecated and phased out in the 3.x release train. So that requires some temporary duplication in the language, but the end result should be a more compact and regular language. So here's a list of some of the replacements that are in store and some of the, most of the things you've seen. So exports, uh, exports we haven't seen, top-level definitions uh, would replace uh, package objects. The delegates replace implicit defs, vals, objects, conversions. Extension methods uh, replace implicit classes. And inline staging and match types replaces the current macros. 
when I present that, uh, I hear sometimes uh, complaints which says, well, why so many new features at once? Can't you do it bit by bit over many, many releases? Wouldn't that be a saner way to do it? Well, the one pro problematic point here, the one constraint here is really that Scala 3 is when the books will be rewritten. So essentially now all my books, all my tutorials on Coursera will have to be rewritten or re-recorded because things, I mean, you wouldn't want to start a tutorial uh, without enums or without uh, extension methods and this, these things. These are things that are basic enough that you want to do them even in beginner's courses. So that means that the features we need to get in now in 3.0 are features that affect the foundations of Scala, that simplify life, in particular for learners, because you don't want to teach a more complicated version when in Scala 3.1 a simpler replacement will come out and that will replace existing features. You don't want to write a book or a new version of the book with a feature that will be replaced in the next version of Scala afterwards. So that also was for us a very strong guidance what to put in this language release. We prioritized foundations, simplifications and restrictions. Uh, we did not prioritize, so we, we, a second fiddle were uh, the features that give added power to expert developers. And there were a lot of propositions about those, of course. So essentially new forms of four expressions or things like that, new forms of pattern matching that make certain specialized idioms easier to express. Nothing is wrong with them, but we felt that we don't need to put them into Scala at 3.0. We have enough uh, to do already with all the simplifications and restrictions and foundational additions that we want to do. So how do we, how do we get there? How do we get to 3.0? Uh, we have a source compatibility for a very large common subset. Uh, we will rely to some degree on rewrite tools, uh, tools that can handle much of the rest. I'm quite confident that the situation is a lot better than Python, with which often this is often uh, compared, uh, also because it's a transition from two to three. Uh, mostly because we have static typing, and in, in fact, we have taken great pains not to change the runtime behavior at all, uh, but really any changes we, there would be would affect the types. So it would be things you grapple with at, at compile time rather than while you debug your program or while your, your software is in production. And uh, because of binary compatibility. So why binary compatibility? Well, already today we can mix Dotty, so the precursor of Scala 3, and Scala 2.12 or uh, Scala 2.13 soon, as soon as that has, has essentially uh, significant adoption, we'll switch to that. So it means we can have a Dotty or Scala 3 module that sits on top of Scala 2 library and can consume it, no problem. Uh, so we, are not, we don't need to essentially bring everything up to three. One can switch. Uh, in the future, this will actually go both ways. Uh, so uh, we, it will also be possible to have a Dotty library module that can then be consumed by a Scala 2 module or a Scala 3 module. So that means you can really mix and match things on the binary level uh, as, as you want, and that means you don't need to bring the whole ecosystem over to 3, as was the case in, in Python 3, of course. So the reason why it all works is called Tasty, Typed Abstract Syntax Trees. I've already talked at length about them at previous conferences. Essentially what it is, is it's a way to serialize your whole program in a form which, is, which has all the types and all the implicit and everything is in there. Everything is very, very explicit in these things. And, but on, on the other hand, it doesn't have any of the encoding problems that we need then to map this on other platforms, like the JVM or JS or, or native or things like that. So it's basically a, high, a, the, a maximally explicit high-level format of your program. The amazing thing is also very comp compact. It's about as compact as source. And the idea is that then this would be the standard format that people could uh, essentially map to and consume, and that would make it uh, possible, uh, this uh, set of interoperability where we have two and three modules talking to each other. The other promise of this, oh, and I should say there's a talk about this by Guillaume Martres on Wednesday 10.15, uh, if you're interested in, in hearing more about this. 
Um, the other cool thing about Tasty is that it promises a solution, at least a partial solution, to the binary compatibility problem. So the plan is to keep the Tasty format stable, binary compatible, over the whole three Dardic series, unlike currently where, we, unfortunately, we have to break uh, the, the format with every uh, uh, major version because essentially there's always a little t tweak or another that doesn't work uh, on the by, with the way we we, um, we compile to bytecodes. So that means that compile from Tasty then allows code to migrate without the current problems of binary compatibility. So. Uh, I, between 3.0 and 3.1, there will probably be still some, some, some shakeouts and things like that, but the hope is that afterwards we will have a completely different binary compatibility story. So you can try it out today. Uh, it's at .epfl.ch. And I thank you all for listening. And uh, I think uh, we are all ready over time. Sorry? Okay, cool. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Exciting times ahead. Thank you very much, Martin. And thanks, everyone. I just want to say that thanks again for coming. Uh, thanks to Signify, we have drinks and food outside. Please enjoy yourself until 9 p.m. And for speakers and families, we meet in front of the registration at a quarter to seven. A quarter to seven, please. It's a dinner. It's not only food and drinks, it's a dinner. It's a real dinner. Oh my God, okay. Now you heard, it's Swiss, it's a real dinner, it's not just finger food. So enjoy yourself, thank you very much, see you tomorrow morning, thank you. <laughs>